Hey guys, welcome to another session of RBTL, a reading between the lines. This is the October 27th balance adjustment preview, as long with the uh, Hua Yang thing that I, you know, I talked about in a previous video, that nerf coming in uh, the same patch, so the October 27th patch, but that was announced uh, uh, at the end of September, the Hua Yang nerf that is. That won't be talked about in this one, so apparently they are not going to adjust it, um, at least not yet. We don't know by her release are they gonna readjust what they propose to be the nerf we don't know but we definitely we don't find out in this patch in this one though we do have some spicy uh what's well, it one it's a really big one all right so four uh six five stars three of them being ml5s which is pretty big and then a pretty substantial ml4 uh and then jenna which we'll talk about that in a separate thing but overall if you have read this patch preview, I think you would come to the same conclusion that I did. I think that the heroes that uh, are brought up here are not necessarily buffed in a way that they will interact differently in the current meta. Um, there might be a different role, but it definitely seems that they're improving their original intent um, in terms of the, the character's roles. So in, in none of these balance, like, these heroes all look like pretty much the same thing except that they will do to perform their role better so in terms of all of their previous counters that made them irrelevant or less played uh have not really been shaken off all right so we'll talk about that as we go through and then we got uh, chatty and alabastrin uh, artifact buff first things first is remnant violet i think this one's pretty big um so again keep in mind that what i just said is that um, I don't believe any of these buffs really solve their current counters. So for example, Remnant Valor would be like something like C. Lilius, uh, Angel of Light, uh, Solitaria. Like he doesn't necessarily shake those off uh, with this balance patch. But what it does do is that it makes Remnant Violet a very, very scary uh, last pick in terms of like a world arena scenario. If you're using Remnant Violet in a, like, let's say arena or even in... Uh, uh, Guild War like offense wise um, like he has also more versatility because right now he's less passive So in the in the past Remnant Valor used to be like a more passive but aggressive hero, right? So you have the the Damage that he outputs but realistically and this is the issue that he suffered with in World Arena as well Realistically, you're waiting for them to hit you and when they do hit you hopefully they miss So Remnant Violet was often like a hero that you know, you know, he could do a lot of damage but you kind of sit him back, right? Um, and, and in this case, in his new change, realistically, he's still the same threat, but just more threatening now. Now on his turn, he becomes much more oppressive. Um, and so in other words, your use of Remnant Violet, whether it's in World Arena, which I think will be still the main case, or offensive uh, PvP, like A versus AI, then you will be able to rotate him faster, right? So first things first is his soul burn has now changed. So before, 10 extra 10 souls would give him an extra turn on his attack buff. Now the soul burn on Remnant Violet was hardly, hardly ever used until it was like a 1v1 scenario and you had no other souls to burn anyway. So you may as well have his attack buff higher in terms of uh, longer. Um, this soul burn is much more effective um, I could definitely see this being used or saved so that Remnant Violet can soul burn, access a soul burn. Um, because not only does this grant him an extra turn, um, it also improves with his new passive. Uh, so everything else is the same except the soul burn granting an extra turn is super big on him. Already, he could cause two times the damage on his turn for the S1, but then potentially uh, use the uh, Massacre. Um, so his new passive, Concentration Awaken, let's just read this. At the start of the battle, at the end of the turn, has 100% chance to evade. So it's the same as before here, but the, here's the difference. So as, after successfully evading, gains one focus, and then uh, when five focus after attacking or being attacked, consumes it all and uses Massacre against a random enemy. So because he gains one focus per S1, if you grant this, uh, you do it twice, you'll, you'll, you'll get this really quick. Now there is a there is a really meme play. Is uh, if you're doing offensive fight with like so, let's say Remnant Violet, uh, there is a Dust Devil play. Now there were used to be a uh, a used to be a player. I don't believe he plays anymore, but he used to have a Guild War defense where he had uh, Remnant Violet on Dust Devil, 
uh, speed set with Dust Devil. That was actually Cancer. It was like Remnant Violet with Cerise or something like that. It was actually Cancer. So I'm just thinking like there is still a play there. Of course, you're going to give up an artifact that gives you a 20% extra evasion on top of his 50%. So there is that cost, but a Dust Devil with this would be insane because the Dust Devil proc on the S1 would still give him the focus no matter what, right? So in terms of if you Dust Devil proc, that's two focus right away. So it would be just an insane, insanely aggressive play. I actually, no, no kidding. I actually believe in World Arena, a Dust Devil Remnant Violet could still be usable. Um, it just depends if your draft is very aggressive, which I, I do believe that if anything, this entire patch is like siding onto the already obvious aggressive agenda that Epic Seven wants you to play. He, they want you to play aggro. They want you to play aggressive. And if you don't play aggressive, you're playing standard and your standard comp, which we'll talk about when we get to bad card Armin, is all about like disgusting crowd control like solitaria i would consider solitaria a, a, a standard hero like archdemon shadow senya those types so like i feel i feel like remnant violet no kidding like i said dust devil could be an interesting play again you're giving up something but you're getting gaining something else okay anyways so this is this is the this is the big changer right before it had to be a five focus and after being attacked so when you have five focus filled before and you were attacked even if it didn't miss but he didn't die if it didn't miss he would still unlock massacre but now it's it's both and so now remnant violet is no longer a hero you can just be like okay let's save him to the end and hope rng works out my way right now you have to be like aggressively attacking him which again makes his buff i think very very strong in the rta meta um people were picking up remnant violet again especially late pick because then the your your opponent would pick him late, or you would pick him late, so that your op the, the opposing side will not have enough picks for counters. So he was he was always that kind of threat, but now he's even more threatening. So I definitely think that this buff is very very good for him. It also does make him cooler because the, I mean the way he works is just cool anyway. Um, the other thing is that not only did he get like insanely good buffs on S1 and the passive. His attack buff is now three turns no matter what. So the soul burn, like basically he didn't lose anything. He just gained everything. <laughs> um, you don't need to soul burn the S3 for the three turns. He gets the three turns anyway. Um, and you know, the massacre is, he, he, I think unless you get stripped, his massacre uptime is going to be almost like, sorry, the attack buff uptime is going to be almost all the time now. Really, so so realistically, he he is just such a good hero now, in my opinion. Um, five turn cooldown, um, but that's okay. I think most of the time, after you do the actual skill massacre, not the not the passive way. Uh, I think I think you. I mean, it, it does help him. No matter what, it does help. Um, but uh, yeah, I I think like this is this is just crazy. This is a crazy buff. Realistically, you're you're banking on the passive, and then the new S1, the Soul Burn. Um, again, this now has a lot of play for Remnant Violet again. The counter builds uh, did come out for a while, um, so that you can gain the focus, but now you have the double-edged Decrescent, the Ervalin's Artifact, which some people are already running with Lifesteal, right? Uh, so now that has a benefit as well. Uh, the double-edged decrescent artifact, obviously, it's RNG upon RNG, right? One, you have to dodge, and then the other is after you dodge, you have a 30% chance to counterattack. But if you do do that, I do still think that uh, with the new Remnant Violet buff, that could be the play as well. But I honestly think that this buff is so flexible that if you want to bring out the counter Remnant Violet again, if you want to bring out Lifesteal with double-edged decrescent, Lifesteal on Shepard, so the current, uh, the current meta build, if you want to bring out speed, I think it's all good. You just have to make sure he has a soul burn. And honestly, he can work into ag very, very aggressive teams. Like, I'm picturing this myself or how I do, like, let's say arena hits and maybe even guild war hits. Honestly, pack him with a book, pack him with a pusher, and you're you're pretty much just killing things. Um, it's, it's actually pretty nuts. I really like this buff, okay? I really like this buff. Like I said at the beginning, this buff does not make him OP in the sense that now he could be first picked because the issue is that he still has those counters 
that are running around, which is good. But they didn't buff him to counter his counters. They buffed him just to make himself stronger. Um, and I think his play is very nice. Top model Luluka's buff seems insignificant in terms of smaller compared to Remnant Violet. But in my opinion, again, it's still a very nice buff. Now, whether or not she's going to be played a lot, I'm not quite sure. But uh, I will have a comment on this because her buff is heavily reliant on gear. Whereas something like the Leica EE, uh, the DN EE, giving them extra speed so that they could be top tier speed contesters is a bit different than Top Model Luluka's. Because Top Model Luluka's base speed is like 114, 115 or something like that. Um, it's not the fastest in the world. Uh, but she's seeming like she wants to be built as an opener or as an opener option, right? So we have uh, Victory Pose now uh, gaining 20% CR uh, for all allies instead of 15, which is great. Um, oh wait, just look at this. Um, but everything else is the same. Okay, so now she has a more of a group, a group mentality, right? Um, and as well, she's also a damage dealer. So in the same vein as let's say, uh, which is mo charles closer charles except that hers is a non-attack skill so again keeping in mind that her original counters are still relevant so she doesn't shake those off with this new buff so paulo to celine i guess taeyu i when i say taeyu i'm always putting in air quotes right now because i haven't seen taeyu proven to be super good or at least in the in the territory of like a politis for example um but we also have stuff like rimuru that can steal her buff um, and potentially one-shot her even if she has Dignus Orb. So so it's like things like that that still keep Top Model Luluka kind of suppressed. But in my opinion, um, obviously this buff is better than it was before. Now the other thing, the other aspect is that uh, increases uh, the attack buff for all uh, allies except the caster. So she self-attack buffs. So it doesn't really matter. Um, but the a demolish. So after she does the S3. Because since she grants an extra turn on this. Realistically what you're seeing. Unless she dies to a Rimru or a Selene. Realistically she's functioning like a Bunny Dom. ML Charles type right. So she, she, she does damage. She does her own damage. And then she attack buffs the entire team. So this attack buff does come after her demolish. Which is the S3. Um, so she definitely has to not die on the turn of her doing victory pose, right? Um, but you end up with, assuming everything goes well, you do end up with a two-turn attack buff for all the allies. So again, siding on that aggressive agenda that Smallgate keeps us keeps us wanting to go on. Um, the imprint concentration also super high value, although her attack is pretty high because she's also a mage. Her attack is pretty high, so. The attack imprint before was good, but the very fact that they're going with the crit rate imprint, um, generally this means, you, you get more gear screw out of this for, for sure, but generally this means that people who have access to the speed gear to make her high speed DPS is going to make a better build in general. Um, so we do have a like a top, top player, name is Kenny. Um, if you're watching this video, you pretty much know who he is, but if you don't know who he is, he's well known for 300 speed top model Luluka. Uh, I think he used to run Black Hand of the Goddess to compensate for the lack of crit rate because again, if you have top model Luluka at that kind of speed with damage, you're going to be giving up something, right? So either you have near 100% crit rate and lower damage, or you have to lower the crit rate and up the damage or rather keep the damage high. But with the crit rate imprint, this usually means that those heroes can be run really fast without much cost. And I say this as a, you know, as an example, of course, Closer Charles, self-crit rate imprint. Sylvan Sage Vivian, self-crit rate imprint. Uh, what's her name? Emma Celine. So, uh, Spirit Eye Celine, self-crit rate imprint. And you see how those heroes are roughly built, and they can be built quite easily with high speed gear and also maintain damage. And so, so I do believe that they, they knew this going in and changing her, her imprint. Because the thing is, like, changing a ML5's imprint from something that was okay before to something like this is like insane value this is the second best imprint concentration outside of speed this is like this is huge and so you know that they're not really hiding their agenda and they want you to use her that way right but just to keep in mind that her her 
role i believe in world arena will still be that you know you gotta like pre-ban the politics you have to pre-ban the saline but at the same time it's like is that isn't that kind of scary right um aggressive players or cleavers now have so many different options your tank down method has got to be insane like if you're tanking down as anti-cleave and you're not speed contest and con contesting it's a it's a feels bad game at the moment um i i know personally that it has never been this bad in the case of the history of epic 7 speed gear has always been really dominant but we've had a couple seasons where it was just slightly better in terms of control um you can tank down you can use rng heroes to stop cleave uh now there's just so many ways to get around those kind of mechanics that you almost have to compete speed to speed um if you want to guarantee a win and even then you don't guarantee it because you don't know your opponent's speed unless you do unless you do um so that's my comments on tom model luluka very good buff okay very good buff doesn't shake off her weaknesses at the moment in my opinion but it definitely gives her a more defined role she's no longer just a cr booster but then like a selfish damage dealer she's a cr booster that can also do damage but then also set up everyone else to do high amounts of damage so again with the remnant violet buff and her uh, that aggressive play is going to be very toxic in the upcoming season or two all right captain flan let's talk about this so ex execution so 75% chance to steal one buff. Now, I did a reading on this on stream one night after the RTA season because um, that was a Friday at the end of the RTA, RTA season. I didn't have time to look over this and really digest. Uh, but we definitely confirmed it that the stealing one buff is like ML Rin. Um, so it's not Rimuru's copying buff, it's stealing. So technically it serves as a strip. So it serves as a, a dispel or yeah, a, dis uh, a strip from uh, an opponent's buff. So let's say for example it's an immunity buff uh that they have and you have a 75 percent chance to quote unquote dispel it but really you're stealing it because you're stealing it back for herself um so no matter what this s1 has insanely high value um she is also definitely tuned to be best in slot with uh summertime a series artifact for sure um before she had a struggle where she could crit and if you crit you don't uh proc the the artifacts bomb but now she no longer crits <laughs> so it's it's uh they're, they're really leaning into it and really i think pirate captain flan doesn't have any better artifact than that now right like so the summertime mysterious artifact if you only have one copy like moi like myself you will be thinking about do i want it on cesiri or do i want pirate captain flan i'm probably gonna put it on pirate captain flan though especially after the buff i think it looks good i think she looks good so the scourge of the sea uh yeah so this Increase the effectiveness by 50%. Now, it does look like it's not a buff, right? This just feels like it's a passive that she just innately gets. Um, so, no matter what build you have, you have 50% effectiveness already, which makes her build much more easier to obtain. You could even run like what people run with Senya, some ER on it, in case somehow that is an issue for you. Um, I, I did watch a streamer, a Taiwanese streamer that... Uh, ran a er hybrid effectiveness uh pirate captain flan and it, it looked really good so i tried to copy the build i couldn't do it but with this a 50 effectiveness i think that makes it a lot easier uh to manage if that's what you're going for uh when attacking cannot trigger a critical hit so that's that's pretty good right so when attacking cannot trigger a critical hit i do believe that this means her own turn but it doesn't matter anyway since the the Ceseria artifact does not trigger on a dual attack or anything like that so in terms of the mechanic this if it reads as if on their turn it doesn't trigger a critical hit but it could be both but regardless it doesn't really matter because like i said the artifact only procs one way um so redirects three percent okay we already know this so this is uh summertime sorry not summertime uh ssb uh ssb is passive so the damage sharing um so e it wouldn't stack with orius but it will stack with adamant shield c armin's passive and all the other type of stuff um, you could run her on Proof of Valor, I suppose, but again, like I said, you need that bomb on the S1, and she's really re technically rebuilt to be Ceseria's artifact as her best in slot. After execution, so after the S1, when the caster has a buff, activates Hunt. Hunt can only activate once every two turns, and then it boosts the combat range by 15%. 
this has always been a nice thing um because realistically if you're using pirate captain flan you're not necessarily in an aggressive mode so either you are drafting her into a team that they they can't afford another cleanser in terms of they never secured a cleanser in the first couple slots in world arena and their last pick is a cleanser you could just ban it or that uh that Wait, what was the other condition? Sorry, sorry, I lost, I lost my train of thought. Uh, but regardless, what I mean is that in Pirate Captain Flan's case, uh, oh, sorry, you're waiting. I was gonna say this. You're waiting for the cleanser to take your turn. So, in Pirate Captain Flan's team comp, generally speaking, you're not going full aggressive. Like, so she can be slightly on the slower side, um, but you're waiting for certain things to happen or not happen before you go. So her combat readiness for the allies after her own. Uh, execution uh this is pretty good this is once every two turns um and now it uh i do believe that is not yeah so this was on the caster's turn before but this is not anymore so in terms of a dual attack if you do execution you can do this but of course the cooldown is still every two turns so sometimes it could screw you over because now you no longer have control of the combat readiness on her turn if you accidentally draw a dual attack for example this might not benefit you. Regardless, I would still consider this a buff and not a nerf. It's just that you do have to keep in mind that now it is it is triggerable through a, even a counter attack, actually. Um, based on this uh, wording, if you have her on counter set, even counter attack, this would proc. But it is once every two turns. So it just depends on if you want it to proc or not on, the, on her turn or when it's an off turn. Like, does that matter for you? Um, I'd say it could matter because a, a full team CR boost could ruin a speed tuning for a certain fight. You don't know. But again, I don't consider that a nerf. I definitely think that they meant it to be a buff. But it is just a mechanic that I want to bring to your attention. That it could act like a nerf in certain situations. Um, because you don't have full control. Uh, the last thing would be the full burst. So we to look at the after version. Increase the attack of the caster for 3 turns instead of 2. So fantastic, of course. Um, keeping that attack buff up time is really, really good for her because then you can, you know, your bombs do more damage as well. Um, but realistically, she's a crowd control hero. Attacks all enemies with a barrage of cannon fire and then increasing, sorry, decreasing or pushback by 30%. And then also increasing combat rates by, by 50%. So increase of a 5% pushback, which is pretty big. Right? It's pretty big. Um, so she has CR boost for her full team. She has pushback. She has bomb. She can steal buffs. So strip and then apply to herself. Uh, which then if you're going to bank on that 75%. Uh, realistically what's going to happen is that. You're going to pick and choose. Which one you could benefit from. Right? So for example your opponent has a defense buff. That's a perfect one to steal. Because it benefits her. And then it benefits you from taking it away from your opponent. So I think her... Her buff will, you know, she'll still be in the same slots in World Arena as a pretty late pick, in my opinion. Pretty late pick, because you still need a strip um, to make sure that, you know, maybe they're not on immunity or whatever. Uh, or you have to make sure that they have no cleanser, so you can just rotate around uh, until their immunity fades out, and then you can do the S3. But regardless... Um, because if the, even if they do have immunity, you can start off her turn just by doing the S1, 75% chance, um, you know, minus the effect, res uh, the resistance check, to take away that immunity, and then the bomb them on turn one. So, I think, you know what, maybe she's not so late pick, maybe you can be more aggressive and play her a bit earlier, um, since she does her own strip mechanic now. Uh, so actually, you know, I just reassessed that, I do believe that she can be played earlier, but again, uh, this is uh, one of my one of my friends, Winter Wish, one of the legend players. He made that comment as well. It's like either you're playing aggressive or if you're playing passively, you just have really disgusting crowd control heroes. And it does seem to be the case. There's no longer this kind of neutral ground where you're just passively dealing damage, you know? Like, yeah, sure, you got the Shu, you got the Lencia, you got the Lionheart Sermias and stuff like that. They'll still always be there, but it feels like in standard play, you one side will pick up a Senya, one side will pick up an Archdemon Shadow, uh, one side will pick up a Solitaria. It's gonna be like one or the other, like almost in all fights that I've seen, especially near the wrap of the Conquest RTA season. That was the case, which is really, it's really sad. 
to be honest. <laughs> uh, anyways, Vildred buff. Is there any more I need to talk about here? Vildred has consistently been really good, especially for aggressive or cleaving players. Being the 12, uh, 12 speed imprint AoE, um, except for himself, of course. And his kit has always been good. Uh, now it is just better. Damage dealt increase, damage dealt increase, damage dealt increase, damage dealt increase. I don't think I need to spend much time there. <laughs> Again, another hero to add to the arsenal of aggressive players or cleaving players. The Hawk, this one's pretty big in my opinion. So the Hawk's elaborate plan, which is the S2, now used to grant a barrier um, and I think it did cleanse it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dispels two debuffs. You can still dispel to two debuff. The barrier part, I, I never found it to be that crazy. So Myza Hawk is level 10 friendship. S1, S3 is max. Um, back in the day when in Guild War, that was he was super good because of all the, the green violets running on the Guild War defense. Um, and he's still good today. Uh, right now, like I'm using him against Shu, using him against Senya, stuff like that because he has the crit passive and stuff. Um, so my my uh, elaborate plan, I think it's at like plus two or plus three. It's uh, somewhere there uh, based off the level 10 friendship, the, the extra skill enhancement you get. But now he's going to be a plus 15 hero for sure. But now look at what he does. So he can dispel the two debuffs, but also increase the combat range of, of, of an ally any ally you choose by 15% and then grants an extra turn to the caster. So realistically his play now is that he's going to S2 no matter what and then you're going to do the S3 or even potentially Soulburn S1. But here's the thing, I if I remember correctly, he does have an EE that not he, he has an EE that does the uh, resource reduction which is the most common one that people run. But I believe he has an EE that if you do S2, it grants the attack buff. So before it was a barrier with attack buff. Now imagine this, if, if I'm right, and you know, I, I don't have the game open so I didn't check, but I'm pretty sure I'm right, like 95% sure I'm right. There is an attack buff EE. So if you have the attack buff EE plus a 15% CR boost to a single target, and it grants him an extra turn, what does that mean? That means he can potentially finish or like soften a hero so far down that whoever he pushes can get the kill right away so you could have realistically you could have a bruiser is a hawk you can have him really fast either way his utility is insane because before he had some utility with this but he was mainly a damage dealer that needed a team to carry him like he was invincibility for one turn but you th the reason why he's played so little is that if unless you run a bruiser as a hawk with lifesteal or sigurd scythe he was very vulnerable right so you would only pick him into cases where you know you could finish off you, the opponent's main damage dealer really quick but because of the invincibility he could struggle into something like alencia um he could get provoked by senya even while he's invincible like so there's there's a lot of stuff that he struggled with but with this new buff his role becomes more like he, he could do damage but also let's bring another damage dealer with him that does insane amount of damage because you can now push um and so i think that you know a lot of people have been running different zahawks and zahawk is viable in very different builds and uh methodologies in terms of using him i i think he's one of the most flexible rgb damage dealers that you can have and that opponent's can't really have a pulse on it. So for example, like like Ervalin, if you see him drafted against you, you know that he's gonna be like a full damage dealer, right? And on the other hand, if you see as a hawk, you're just like, okay, is he is he gonna be a bruiser? Does he have Sigurd Sight that can he sustain? So when you see as a hawk, your plan to approach him is much different than let's say an Ervalin. Um so I feel that with this new buff though, uh like people can still be running the speedy as a hawk, because again he has so much free gear score, you could run him fast if you have the gear. Run him fast with damage, you could run him bruisery as a support with this push. But regardless, again this, this keeps leaning back to the same thing I said at the beginning, is that the aggressive nature of Epic 7, it, it is something that they want to see. They want to see this for the spicier tournaments, for the spicier content. Um, and I do think that they, they're, they're just leaning into it, man, they're not hiding at all. Um, and so, if you as a player 
you are really tired of hunting the speed gear while epic 7 keeps on saying okay we're gonna make other gear more relevant it does seem like it's not the case i i mentioned this on my initial thoughts for ml lena the astro master lena video is that her even if people say that she's really bad her mechanic is telling you something right so even if she, in practice she's really bad her mechanic of suppressing counter attacks is telling you something is that if you have a counter set or you rely on heroes that have counter mechanics built in don't rely on it anymore <laughs> we want you to play speed right that's really what it's saying right so we've got the katie's hunts of course you got you got some usable stuff like for banshee you still have lifesteal you still have destruction you still have uh resistance sets which just they're still good uh but like wyvern is just so high value now right like it's just not now sorry it has always been but more so but now it's not only just oh hunt wyvern you want hunt hunt wyvern but you want just the speed gear um because that opens up so many other options if you have everyone speedy i've mentioned this a year ago when i made my initial thoughts on ran if you have every single hero fast and they have different utility aspects in their kit why are you using anyone else if everyone's fast you always use the fastest hero with the best amount of utility and zaha could be built fast if you have the gear his base speed is not incredibly high but he has free gear score top model luluka you know and and all these heroes like you know i don't need to name them all everyone knows this okay but it's just uh yeah so these buffs while cool right one for one these characters are getting buffed Ooh, awesome awesome man. i got my tama luka buff i got my remnant violet buff um but really this is like a it opens up a greater discussion right uh okay so blue luka let's just talk about this really quick not much to talk about 100 crit uh the defense break fantastic i do run her for my pve content so can't wait to see this buff very very good and then back out armin this is gonna take uh the the rest i believe the rest of the the patch note discussion what I said before, again, with the Senya, Solitaria, Archdemon Shadow, you know what, unless you double up on cleansers or you have heroes that can self-cleanse, and even heroes that can self-cleanse, eh, it's it's half-half sometimes, right? Like, okay, yeah, you have Edward into Solitaria, alright? You have, let's say, like, Crimson Seed A. Robbie trying to survive the Archdemon Shadow. Um, but the, the, the thing is, like, these heroes, Senya and all these heroes, they, their debuffs are so toxic that even some cleansers are not that effectual in, in, in their fights, right? Like, so when you see them, you're really doubling up on cleansers. And then is that enough? Like, does the cleanser cleanse enough or fast enough? Because most likely your opponent might be banning either your damage, so you have like no damage, or they're banning one of your cleansers and then is one of their cleansers enough? Backyard Armin adds to this cancer. Um, so originally she did some injuries, right? All right, cool. I think before when she was released, that was a really cool concept. I was hoping that she was good. Now, in my opinion, she's just way more disgusting. So instead of giving her like injury, they just let's, okay, this is, okay, let's screw that. Screw that. Let's give her something that people want, or maybe they don't want, but it's what Smogit wants you to want. It's to be a cancer a cancer rng debuffing hero so 45 percent chance to provoke for one turn damage that proportion of the castle's max health but that's okay that's okay the damage will always come in to play it's just like fcc can do a lot of damage even though you don't have crit rate crit damage um and yuha as well uh but uh but i mean it's it is a it is an afterthought of course um into a cleaver comp or squishy comp this is gonna add up because you want her to be bulky no matter what so it's just giving you extra benefit from the from the uh, uh hp damage uh, okay so when you're doing on the caster's turn when you are doing are you ready it changes the attack to targets all enemies so luckily it does not trigger with counters it does not trigger with dual attack um at least the aoe aspect of it all right but it is 45 percent. so thank goodness but 45 is still very disgusting especially when it's aoe um, it does change dual attack to, uh, does all enemies and the changed attack cannot trigger a dual attack so on her turn she can never draw someone else into a dual attack so if the provoke part right that's the that's the really really scary part right away and let's talk about uh catch him 
After being attacked, has a 50% chance to increase from 40. You increase the critical hit damage of the foremost ally for one turn, making the foremost ally a, a counter attack. So this is very, very good synergy with your S1, right? So you're drawing provokes on everyone to hit herself. And then when you do that, it, it has a chance to increase the critical hit damage of the front ally and then also making them counter attack. When the attacked, uh, when attacked by an enemy inflicted with a provoke or redirect a provoke, the chances doubled. That's insane. That's very, very much insane. So like, redirect provoke, um, like with C Lilius into Bad Cat Armin as the highest HP. Can you imagine the cancer, right? <laughs> Can you imagine the the actual cancer? Um, it is doubled. So you have a one hundred percent chance. Or that frontmost ally to critical like to, to get the critical hit damage buff first and then also to counter attack now there's a lot of plays in that right so you can you can benefit off a, a very high damage dealer let's say landy uh landy could be really good in that slot there you can have like maybe even a bruiser landy if you want survival you can have someone who again self cr boost you can have someone who does strip on the s1 you can have someone who does the um does uh debuffs on the s1 um, all those things uh, are in insanely good, but the, the issue is that, of course, the chance of it happening is it could be a 100%, and that's pretty crazy. And it cannot be triggered by extra attacks or counter attacks, so... Okay, so that part's okay, right? So, like, it at least it helps a bit, but it's still very, very toxic. We took a look at, uh, is this it? Nya ha ha. Ha ha. Uh, the After Awakened version. Uh, attacks the enemy with a huge explosion, provoking for one turn, increases the defense of the caster for two turns, grants a barrier to all allies for two turns, and then damage dealt and barrier strength proportion to the caster's max health. So you can run her fast, you can run her on, I don't know, you can run her on counter even. Just like think about it like almost like a Senya, right? So that like, you continually get them provoke locked into you if you don't want to bank on, you know, a solo on her own turn, like 45%. You could have her on counter, you could have her on almost anything really. If you have her on a speed speed set, you could run her fast so she can AoE provoke more often as well. Um, there's just so many ways to play her in my opinion that uh, she's just going to be very very annoying to deal with. I mean heck, you can even bring back the injury set if you want the maximum amount of mechanical effectiveness. So if you want like, if you want the provokes coming in, if you want uh, some injury while you're doing damage, while you're being protected, heck, you could put her on injury. I don't think it's out of the question. Uh, it's just like more versatility now. But mainly, her kit has changed so much that I think that she will be played. So if you have Bad Cat Armin, you are very lucky, and I think she's going to be very disgusting. Um, yeah, so yeah, because you increase the defense for yourself, provoking one turn, you get that, get that ball rolling, so to speak, right? Um, on, on her own turn too, mind you, uh, without just the S1. Uh, increasing that defense, setting up, and the, the barrier for everyone else. It's just, overall, man, just really disgusting. The Soul Burn also only 10 souls, but can also provoke for two turns instead. So two turn provokes has always been really, really annoying. Just kind of like Falcon or Cleary. Um, she doesn't do a strip herself, but it is still really disgusting. Cooldown is now three. Acquired Soul is less than before, but it is overall just better just better <sighs> Ed, i can't even I, I can't even imagine how annoying this is <laughs> jenna okay so jenna got a buff right so originally i was like what the frick does jenna do first i hate her design i think she looks ugly but it seems to be the case with like uh rol getting a buff although hassle got a buff last patch but she didn't get a specialty chain Jenna getting a buff now, it, it is definitely up in the air, right? Like, can Hassel get a specialty change soon? Uh, I highly doubt it because we got ROL, which is a is still an ML. So maybe Jenna will be next, right? So it is interesting to keep in mind her buff right now in case the specialty change comes in, so we're more familiar with it. So uh, increase the, uh, the damage dealt increase uh, the number of debuffs. Um, not as crazy before. I think that her new... Compared to her old kit, her new kit is much more synergized with what a current meta would require in terms of mechanics. So overall, I think it is a good buff. It's just that I can't comment on how good it is because I never used the, even the old Jenna, uh, let alone I, I won't use her after her buff until maybe a specialty change. 
but uh, 35% chance to stun for one turn on the S1, so cool. Uh, let's go for co Coerce, the Awakened version. 100% chance to decrease the buff duration of enemy by one turn, okay, so that's pretty good. And then, so technically a strip, right, so mainly, mainly for the immunity part. And then granting uh, immunity all allies for uh, two turns. If you soul burn, it grants an extra turn, so I guess you can go into S2, S3, or S2, S1, okay. Um, wait, I'm just reading this part. The one has been. Is there anything changed? No. Okay. So, so I see. I see. So the the skill enhancement gets up to 100%. Okay. Cool. And then cold snap attacks all enemy with frost magic. 75% chance to decrease the defense for two turns. 100% chance to decrease combat range by 20%. You know what? Actually, looking at this, uh, because she's a defense breaker and has a uh, uh, CR pushback, she could be, like right off the bat, she could be usable right away in PvE, um, but I don't think, unless you are a, a player that builds, you know, non-meta heroes, she could be a PvP hero, I guess, right now, but I think, I'm gonna wait for a specialty change, see what kind of direction they want to make her. It's kind of like specialty change Rima, right? I always forget Rima was a specialty change, it ended up being a PvE hero, right? So maybe Jenna will become that, right? Maybe not all three stars are gonna be... I, I highly doubt all three stars are gonna be PvP. I think that what they're really emphasizing is that RGB, five stars, like new banners, it's all PvP play, uh, heroes. ML is all PvP heroes. Three stars, let's make them good. But unless this has a specialty change, they're gonna be PvE main. Uh, Alabastrian uh, buff. Uh, off the reading of this, I don't know. I, I mean, will you use this in a PvP scenario? I'm not quite sure. After attacking with single attack, has up to a 70% chance. So instead of 50% chance to increase the speed, 70% chance to inflict a random debuff for two turns. Like maybe this is PvE. It's 35%. It could. I was thinking that this could maybe be good on Peyra. Um, but Peyra feels like she could use a lot of other stuff. The 35% effectiveness does give it like. Like if you're if you're using Goblet of Oath to like increase your effectiveness because you you your gear just doesn't work out to have high effectiveness, then maybe this is a nice alternative, right? So so sometimes you can't burn to get the stun, right? Sometimes you can't burn to get the stun. So maybe the maybe the S1 having an extra benefit like a you know defense break, uh for two turns, uh a de a, an attack down, speed down, unhealable. Maybe that's all good. So. I was thinking maybe Peyra in terms of a meta thief that could use this. Outside of that, I think PVE main maybe. Um, so yeah, so increase. I mean, it's increased effect, right? Instead of fifty percent to self buff, it is uh seventy percent to do this. Actually, you know what? I do remember people running Alabastrian on Peyra for the speed buff. Um, for the speed buff and and mainly for the effectiveness. But I think half of it was for the chance to proc the speed buff. Um, so. For people who did run the old Alabastrian, that actually might not be good for them. Like, they may not want the debuff, they might just want the chance for the speed buff. But, uh, yeah, that's just my comment on that. Chatty, on the other hand, seems to be very, very good. Uh, Sylvan Sage Vivian, Roy, uh, are two of the mages I can think of using this and benefiting from it right away. However, the, the dilemma always for mages is that, like, even if Chatty is good on X and X hero is book better in some situations and honestly I think yes that's the thing right um I run I like I know a lot of people did run chatty with for Sylvan Sage Vivian I personally didn't go that route mainly because DJB started becoming very prominent and if he inverts the barrier on Sylvan Sage she's dead right like, like as long as chatty procs in the old way if DJB is on the field, uh, if Inverse Barrier, when Chatty's proc, she's dead. Like, there's no, there's not a, there, I've never seen a Sylvan Sage have enough HP to survive her own barrier because her attack is so high. Um, but this as well, like, does that, you know, like, I'm, I'm sure, like, Sylvan Sage and Roy users don't use them that early anyway. So, yeah, you might not need to worry about the DJB. But this does open up an Op Sig kind of thing, right? The only thing is that Op Sig versus uh, Roy and Sylvan Sage might not be able to even one shot on turn one anyway. So it's not terrible and Opsig can't necessarily strip the, like she reduces the cooldown by one turn um, and this has a two turn barrier. 
Yo, realistically, Opsic is killing you on the second turn. So S3 first turn, S2 second turn. If you're using it on those, uh, on those mages, but those mages don't necessarily die even from Opsic, their damage mitigation or their health mechanics. Um, but after being attacked, you know everything else is the same here, and then the barrier strength is also increased. Uh, so overall, Chatty being a, you know, a quote unquote free artifact that you don't you don't have to really pull for. Uh, it is a good buff. Uh, I definitely think that even if some mages are questionable in terms of using it right now, it doesn't mean that in the future it can't be used, right? Um, the very fact it is that it is just to me it is a straight up buff with technically no side effects. Um, so overall, that's a really good buff. Anyways. That was a very very long video um, mainly talking about the aggressive agenda that epic 7 has and continues to push um let me know what you guys think in the comments down below uh in the individual heroes the overall philosophy that i was talking about before as well you know leave it in the comments you guys know that i do read all the comments and sometimes respond to them uh i'm just end this here for the video recording getting very long if you guys have Discord, check out the Discord server, follow me on Twitter, subscribe to YouTube if you haven't, and as always, thank you guys for watching, and I'll see you guys on the next one.